uh, my name is Patty, and um, today I'm giving a talk about friendship, and um, I'm feeling kind of raw because this morning uh, a friend of mine called that I thought wasn't my friend anymore, <laughs> wishing me well. <laughs> so that is just like... I just so grateful. So I was crying, but actually I'm grateful. So um, Lama Jimpa's on retreat because uh, he would be sitting here. And then a person that's a good friend of mine named Colleen, who's a psychotherapist, got sick where she would be sitting here. So now it's kind of trickled down to I'm sitting here <laughs> talking about friendship. So yesterday. Oh, thank you. I good? So then I see lots of friends here. And uh, so uh, I put this together yesterday and I probably will show, but um, hopefully some of you have things to share about friendship and I bet you do because all of us have had friends, whether it's just a few or many, some of us are more introverted, some have lot, so many they can't even count them all, but I'm kind of probably in the middle. So um, I, last week I gave a talk about bodhicitta, which uh, when my friend called me, this texted me actually, uh, it reminded me of bodhicitta because bodhicitta is that kind of love where um, it's uh, like the last day of your life kind of love. And uh, even though it's not, I hope at least it's not the last day of my life, it just felt like kind of one of those times because it was so unexpected. So, um, when last week I mentioned Ananda, I just want to say it again because I think it's a really beautiful uh, story that's pretty famous actually. And it says in, in the story, Ananda was uh, the Buddha's attendant and he was deep in thought for a while. And then he addressed the Buddha like this. He said, I've been thinking spiritual friendship seems at least half of spiritual life. And the Buddha replied, not so Ananda, not so. Spiritual life, spiritual friendship comprises the entire spiritual life. And so that is what leads me to my talk today. So when year, many years ago, when I first started coming here, I was uh, hiding out actually. And um, people that know me already know that story. So I don't want to go into it too much, but I was hiding out. And um, I come from a large family, so it's kind of ironic. <laughs> There's no hiding out when you live in a big family in a very small house. But anyway, I was hiding out because the world felt like too much. And I, basically I had a phobia of crowds. But the problem was the more I hid out, the worse it got. And anyone who has a phobia of flying a plane in an airplane or going tides or whatever, or bugs, you know, the more you try to avoid it and arrange your life around whatever it is, it just becomes bigger and bigger until most, if you're fortunate, you'll get some help because it doesn't have to be like that. So I thought, or at least I hoped that with meditation, I would be able to face these crowds because that prevented me from having a normal job, prevented me from finishing college, prevented me from having the kinds of friends I, would, I was hoping for. So, uh, and I'd heard that some people spend many years in solo retreat and I thought, oh, that's what I need to do just go and be with myself. But that's not what happened for me. As you who know me, I've been really super involved with community. This is my path. And, um, but at the same time, I know I need to spend time with myself to kind of just take a break from it all. So gradually I've made friends here and um, I've learned so much from every one of them. And uh, some of them might not know they're my friend because they're not a traditional friend but they're the kind of friend where they challenge me and that can sometimes be the kind of friend we don't want to be around in a way because uh, they challenge me to look at things i'd rather not see but that's actually what we wish for if we're really if we really understand how precious this life is and how nothing's for sure in the future we want friends that challenge us we might not be able to on the spot respond we might feel reactive, so then sometimes we have to go away from that friend. But those are the best friends. And then other friends support us. They support us by listening to us, maybe talk about how we're ashamed of the kind of friend we are, 
or they might support us by uh, uh, just listening to us when we're not making any sense at all. And those are very special friends too. And I'm grateful for both kinds of friends. And then there's my teacher. I, I don't want to say mine because he's our teacher from so many people here, Lama Chimpa. And he's the kind of friend that is actually embodies both those kind of friends, the supportive one and the challenging one. And he, uh, he's, he teaches what it means to be authentic, but not in a, but authentic, not in the blame kind of way, like where you're going to tell people how it is, you know, or be right kind of authentic, like, you know, that kind of authentic. I'm very familiar with because I've been that one many a time. He teaches about bodhicitta, which I talked about last week, which is having a life of service for others, where your life is about others, not about you. To the point where my darshans with him, or I want it to be about me and my life and me and what I'm doing have become about me following him around, watching him on the telephone with others, watching him invite other people to my darshan <laughs> and talking to them about whatever their trouble is. And so then he, he wants me, not just me, but everybody who calls him their teacher to have a life for the sake of others. And then he's pointing me ultimately to the inner friend, the one that holds the lock and key, the ultimate inner guru that's always present wherever I find myself. So this morning, I thought to string together a few stories about friendship on a personal level, but not just that. But anyway, I'll start there because it's through these relationships that the truth of this world becomes revealed to me and it wouldn't happen without these friends. I think I need a Kleenex. <laughs> Is there Kleenex? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I'm very human. I'm not up in a cloud. <laughs> That's for sure. So yesterday I was cleaning in the office. Like that's what I do on Saturdays. Some people could say, Oh, how, how wonderful you clean an office. How humble of you or something silly like that. But it's not like that. It's just simple cleaning simple compared to other things that I do. And I like to do it actually I do it for me. I'm just cleaning. This is I'm not even that good at it, to be honest. I know people who are good at it. I'm just like clean. I go, who's clean? And then I go, you get what you pay for. So I'm a volunteer. So <laughs> that's the truth. I'm not that good at cleaning, but I do it. So anyway, I was cleaning the office and I saw Judy, who's the office manager, who is my friend. And she's not a Buddhist. She's from another tradition. She's, um, uh, I don't think that's so important. She's just a wonderful person. And um, I love her so much. And I saw her, but I was so busy with my thoughts about today. And, um, and I went upstairs to clean and she was at the bottom of the stairs and she said, I put my brother in hospice. And I'm like, oh my, I was at the top and she was at the bottom and I looked down at Judy and I'm like, oh my gosh. Cause she's very even, like if anyone, everyone who knows her knows, right? Just even, stable. I put my brother in hospice and I'm like, oh my gosh, I stopped. Oh, well, that's so hard. And I said, I'm so sorry that happened. And then she went on, she said, and then I told my sister, she needs to go see him because she might not get to see him again. He's very sick. And, but she wouldn't go because she's afraid of, she's stuck in her room. She's afraid to go out of her room. But Judy is a powerful person. She got her sister. She arranged for people to help her sister go see her brother. She got a social worker. And all these people to come help her sister get ready and go out the door to go see her brother so that she would get to see him before he would leave this world. So I asked Judy, what, how can I support you, Judy? And she said, the truth is, we are all walking each other home. And that's my friend Judy. So she, not a Buddhist, which is so obvious that, you know, this quality that I'm talking about is, doesn't belong to a religion. And I want to be like Judy, actually, because she just set aside her own needs and helped her sister and her brother both. And then on Friday, I came here with a group of people. I'm actually a roadie. <laughs> so <laughs> there's artists and there's roadies and there's some other roadies here. <laughs> and we were all in expressions. Expressions, um, I think most of you know, but if you don't know, it's just a show that it's like a show. It's, uh, it's like a event we put on that um, is about the art, like poetry, music, um, 
poetry and music and dance and anything art related and all these people from all different traditions come here and they give of themselves and they express themselves through art and then some of us like me and Eli and Dylan and Jen and Bill and all sorts of people we try to help them make this happen so we all work together and so we're friends together and it's really fun if you ever feel it on Alex but he brought a bunch of food but they're like oh thank god we have food because sometimes we don't and then Jen goes to Trader Joe's so it's just this kind of <laughs> it's just this kind of chaotic event that is really uh you know it's really about process more than the event like working together to make something happen for it, the, the community because we want our center to not just be us but to be our community everybody is invited so so me and the, the artists and the roadies like me make this all come together and it's really magical so one friend who came and she comes all the time and she's a dancer and a poet and her name's mio and she's from japan and she's also a teacher and she just got in from Japan. And then she, on, th on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, she's doing this show on Friday. I'm like, oh my God, it's kind of incredible. Then on Thursday, she invited her friend who kind of does dance, kind of like African style dance, her dear friend. On Thursday, calls her, writes a poem on Thursday, and on Friday, performs a dance and a poem. And it was like as if, it was at the Mandavi Center. It was so incredible. And she wrote this poem and I can't, I don't have it. So I can't read it to you, but I'll just read this little poem that I made from her poem that doesn't even give it justice, but I just wanted to give you a taste of it. But when her, when she said the poem and her friend danced and it was just, and she cried when she read her poem because it meant her poem meant so much to her and she, she said something, this is the theme, not the poem, because like she's a poet and I'm Patty, but she said, <laughs> she said, do not, she said, and it reminded me, sometimes I say I understand and it reminded me, maybe not say it like that, maybe that, maybe that, maybe that's not what that person needs. So she said, do not say you understand and nod your head and smile, because my heart is breaking, such great sorrow fills my heart, and if you did understand, really understand you would be curled in a ball on the floor and you would not even be able to speak because the pain is so deep so deep so deep the loss so deep the sorrow that's why she read something like that but much much more eloquent and and her friend danced while she said this poem and so for a few seconds after she said this poem and that her friend in the background dancing then nobody talked for just a minute or so and they were fully present to us their friends for 25 years they didn't even need to rehearse they knew each other they were just in sync so poetry and the arts are a way to express this is what lama once said about this uh, absolute truth he said math and science can't touch it poetry the arts can touch what is inexpressible what is what this absolute state so now fall, I was saying this, we enter into fall, but it's so hot out, so it maybe doesn't make sense. But I said, I, I read this quote about fall, which maybe it'd be better to say next month, but it was, you can maybe remember it next month. It said something like this, autumn is the most honest season because it does not pretend that life blooms forever. I just thought that was so beautiful. So I thought understanding that one line could make us want to be a friend, a more because we would understand if we really are remembering and not forgetting we, that we want to be a true friend, not a fake friend, not a friend that smiles and nods their head. And then when you go, they say something about you that isn't kind at all. So earlier I mentioned the kind of friend that some might not consider a friend, but I, I have come to find that this is the most precious friend because they challenge my complacency and my strong concepts about what's right and what's wrong. And especially if they see me in a negative light, I'm like, oh, you know, that's what we need to look at. And that's also an opportunity because in that state, meditation becomes quite vivid. You're like, who is, who is that? And who are they? And what's going on here? And those questions haven't got such clear answers, but the questions themselves are the practice. So, um, it, so it's, they're challenging that we come to appreciate, but maybe not immediately. But later, 
there's an opportunity. Rinpoche, that's, I call Lama Love Rinpoche. It means precious Buddha, but it's interchangeable Lama Love. Rinpoche is saying, he says this about friendship. He sa I said it last week, but I liked it, so I say it again. Our shadows interact with our friend's shadows. And relationships help reveal your unconscious mind, the parts of ourselves that we repress and hide from, that we're not aware of. And, um, and I'm a speech therapy, some therapist, but I always say that, but I think that's not quite true. I'm a speech therapy assistant. This means I don't have a high degree. I have a simple degree, but I work with children. I do the therapy, but I have a supervisor who's so great that helps me do a good job. But I've learned from my life more than my job that communication is more than speech. It's about listening, really listening without advice or rushing to offer solutions. I'm really good at the last solutions. I've been told this and I'm like, that really hurts to hear because I mean well, but it's really could be so annoying. So I notice that in my relationships here at Lions Roar, similar themes arise for me. And I'm like, oh no, there it is again. And I get super discouraged, so discouraged that I can't even hardly come. But I keep coming because I know, because I have some trust built up over time. So I know the lesson isn't learned, and, but I can't go back either. So I have to keep coming and I need help sometimes. So with a trusted friend, my missions of shame, confessions of jealousy, disclosures of trauma, when we see from a friend with acceptance, a loving friend, I have a little opening. I found that out. And friends remind us that we are more than our mistakes, our conflicts and things that have been done to us. And they also mirror back the potential for deep healing that without their friendship would not be possible. That's why when my friend called me this morning, I was like, perfect timing, but also the worst timing because I'm like, <laughs> because, because, you know, I've actually thought of my friend and I felt like a hypocrite to come here and talk about friendship with this really unresolved situation. And nothing's like a one shot deal. Like, oh, you say these nice things and it's all over and it's all good. It's not like that. It's a journey. For me, my friends are not just a pal to go to the movies with, though I like to go to the movie. And for me, my friends are not to go shopping with, though I like to go to Goodwill. And if they like to, too, they can come along. <laughs> They're more. My friends lift me up and challenge me. And they call me out. Rinpoche once said, there's not a greater factor in our environment more influ influential than a close friend. So then uh, uh, one of my friends here, Bill, talked about Thich Nhat Hanh. So I thought, well, maybe it's a sign. Maybe I should look into Thich Nhat Hanh. So I did. And uh, then there was this abbot from Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition from Deer Park Monastery. And he said this, this is his words. He said this about Sangha building. He said, the important thing is the core friendships you create together. You can't fake that kind of thing. People will know whether you have it or not. I think our Sangha, whether we have it or not. A Sangha's true power lies in its depth of spiritual friendship and harmony rather than its number of people. We can start by cultivating just one good friendship with one person in front of us right now. Um, my friend, one of my friends here said, don't say, Patty, talk from your experience, not as many quotes, but I, I just think the qu quotes, I, I would try not to do it as much as I do, but I just really feel so inspired by some of these people that are enlightened. And so I can probably, maybe I'm more relatable being that I'm sort of on the path, I mean, kind of just working my way up the path, but one of the, my favorite people is Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, and he was also, like I've told people here, one of Lama Jimpa's teachers. And he says, this is a pretty famous quote. He says, when you make friends with someone, you accept the neurosis of that friend, as well as the sanity of that friend, you accept both extremes of your friend's basic makeup as resources for friendship. If you make friends with someone because you only like certain parts of that friend, then it's not a complete friendship, but a partial friendship. So my tree is an all encompassing friendship friendship which relates with the creativity as well as the destructiveness of nature. So I like that because of my tendency to only like parts of people. And 
It's true. And then what happens with that? I don't like parts of me. Because then I hide those things and try to just have a good image. And that keeps me wanting to stay home. So over the years I've been here at Lions Roar, my emphasis has changed. I've learned that if I want people to respect me, to listen to my view, to be my friend, I need to first listen to them, to try my best to understand them. And that's the Rinpoche always pushes me in this direction. My task is to try to understand. My goal, not to be right or to win, but I want to be a true friend who wants the best for the other. According, now this is from Chogrim Trungpa Rinpoche and Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. That's my first book that I ever read. And when I read it, it's like a brand new book because I'm brand new, I'm always learning. He says this, he says, there's a very dangerous tendency to lean on one another because I'm a leaner. He says this, there's a very dangerous tendency to lean on one another as we tread the path. If a group of people leans one upon the other, then if one should happen to fall down, everyone falls down. So we do not lean on anyone. We just walk together side by side, shoulder to shoulder. When things fall apart, suddenly your own life and your relationship to all that you've learned becomes a very intense and lonely place to be. I've witnessed this in my friends. And I sometimes think, how are they making it so difficult? And I wonder about if I could do it, and I don't think so sometimes. So I think it challenges me. I'm like, could I face those kind of hardships and those insecurities? Could I? And I don't, I don't know. You know, I, I have to be honest. And then I think, you know, future's unknown, things change on a dime. And I want to, I want to, I wonder, what if I have no one to hold my hand? Would I be able? to apply these teachings that I've learned, would I be able to stand with two feet in this world? Because if I could, then I'm truly walking the path. So, okay, that's mine. And <laughs> that's what I wrote yesterday. So when I was researching this, I, I uh, some of you know, but some of you don't, that I used to do foster care and um, I, uh, and I currently work with emotionally disturbed children, quite a few actually, more and more, they keep coming and um, they're, they're each so different. I have one that says, Miss Patty, you're the nicest elderly person I know. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, Leo, is it? thank you. And then <laughs> this, this is really, and he wants to kiss my hand, which is inappropriate. I go fist bump, you know, he's, he can't be kissing my hand at school, but, um, I have others that would want to beat me up. They want to beat everybody up. So how to love the one that wants to beat me up is different than the one that wants to kiss my hand. And, and that made me like this story. This is a story because how we love people can't all be one note. Not everybody wants a hug. <laughs> Not everybody wants to uh, all touchy feely but they want love, but not doesn't look the same. Love, Lama says love has all these different languages. And so it takes time to love people and respect. And to, the truth is you don't know them, it takes time. So this story reminded me how the Buddha, like Lama knows how to love different kinds of people. And, um, and I just liked it for that. It's about friendship and it's from, this um, sutra called the, I'm not gonna pronounce it right because I, I don't know, but I'm gonna learn this, but I don't, I don't today know the, how to pronounce it, but I'm gonna say it my best shot. It's called Karma Shataka, Karma Shataka Sutra. And it's a collection of teaching stories. So these are, none of these are my words. And in this story, there's a tale of the Buddha appearing as a friend to a young boy who is in desperate need of friendship. The text describes the child born to wealthy householders as ugly in 18 different ways is having suffered intense discrimination on account of his unattractive appearance. When his parents saw him, they were racked with suffering. Though a son has finally been born to us, they thought, what good is he? With such singular flaws, he's, he'd be better off dead. And when night falls, we'll toss him out and feed him to the dogs. So, I mean, this sounds just like a, such a 
a sad story, but I actually come across kids whose stories aren't much better. The boy's mother selfishly, I'll just say, I have a kid right now who witnessed things no one should ever witness. And he's torn up his classroom where it's unrecognizable and everybody's wanting to get rid of that kid. And I myself feel afraid to see, I'm afraid of him, you know, but he comes to see me and he, I found out that he likes Jenga. <laughs> Thank God he likes Jenga. So that's my way to love him and playing Jenga, whatever Jenga it is. And, and he was happy. Anyway, the boy's mother selfishly feared the potential repercussions of their actions. Not she wasn't worried about the painful death of their innocent newborn, but the karmic results for her husband and herself. So she proposed that instead they raise the baby somewhere outside the city. Then when he's grown, she suggested, we'll throw him out of the house to seek his pitiful livelihood. And this is what they did. They called him Verupa, which means ugly. And as soon as he reached adolescence, they banished him. Verupa had no means of providing for himself. He was forced to spend his days begging for food, lugging a walking stick and pot behind him. He grew emaciated from neglect and strangers mistook him for a ghost. And imagining he would attack them, he beat them, pelt, he beat, they beat him, pelted him with dirt, and chased him away. Despairing for his own safety, Verupa hid deep in the forest. He snuck out, out at night, subsisting on food that had fallen to the ground from trees in nearby gardens. The Buddha and his infinite wisdom recognized that the key to alleviating Verupa's suffering lay not only in his receiving food and water, but also in his being known. So I stop here to say, sometimes uh, I've heard Rinpoche say, uh, I've heard him say this to me, and then I turn around and he's saying it to others, which isn't any surprise. He'll say, I see you. So, you know, you know, we, we talk about selflessness here, but it's a really sad feeling when you don't feel seen or known, or when people walk by you and don't acknowledge you. That, so that I just wanted to mention that at this place. So up until that moment, Varupa had only experienced stigmati stigmatization, abuse, misunderstanding, and shame. Knowing the depth of Varupa's poverty, the Buddha brought food and drink. But despite the Buddha's gentle intentions, Varupa was startled by his approach. He had endured too much abuse to believe that the Buddha was anything but another person coming to hurt him. Flooded with helplessness, he started to run. The story tells us that a literal miracle was needed to change Varupa's perception. To reassure Varupa, the Buddha had emanated into a form even more off-putting than Varupa's. In this way, the Buddha could slip undetected past his psychological defenses and invite a breakthrough. The Blessed One performed a miracle that prevented young Varupa from fleeing and caused him to wish to see the Blessed One. So, and just so everyone understands, the Buddha made himself look ugly, more ugly than Varupa. Then Varupa wasn't afraid of him anymore because before he didn't feel worthy of the Buddha's love. I would like to know who that is, Varupa thought, and he came walking back. As soon as young Varupa saw the emanation's extraordinarily ugly features, he began to wonder, who could this be? So he went to where the Buddha's emanation stood. The Buddha's emanation saw young Varupa and made it as if to run away. Varupa had never seen anything like this. He had never met another person who shared this fear that had lived in him for his whole life. In the teachings on karma, the Buddha is careful never to shame a person or their circumstances. The purpose is not to dwell upon the past, but to point the way forward. So I was inspired also by this song by a Sangha friend here who reminded me not to judge a book by its cover. So that's another reason I chose this story. Varupa saw himself in the Buddha, who had assumed a similar form to his own. No longer isolated, he was able to receive the, what Buddha said and apply it to his own life without shame. We can be Varupa and receive the teachings we need from friends, but we can also be the Buddha and use the miracle of friendship to point the way to healing. We can engage our friends in trust, reflect with them about the challenges they're facing, and nurture them with love and compassion. When two people reach out in mutual vulnerability, love's power shines in the simplest of gestures. Let's be friends and make our way together, Varupa said. Let's do that, the Buddha said. 
and they sat down and divided and he sat down and divided his food with Varupa. That's my story. <laughs> and that's my talk for today about friendship. I'm just checking out who's here online. Why I'm doing that, I don't know. I don't have my glasses ever. <laughs> you know? But it looks like some icy pictures I see friends. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not very good at the discussion question answer part because I don't know how to do that yet. But um, if anybody has a comment or question, and if not, I can offer you food today, but I can offer you company <laughs> and coffee afterwards. Yeah. Oh, Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, for asking a question. I can go home and sleep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you for your talk, Patty. I appreciate hearing about friendship and the many values it has. As someone who works professionally with children, I wonder if you ever observe um, like the start of a, of a young person who's going to try and I don't know, not value friends or maybe live life like not making relationships, just a loner. And um, if there's any observations you can share about like how a person ends up that way. Because I'm, I'm thinking in terms of adults I know who like have no friends and don't mm -hmm. seem to care about anyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I see this, I see it all the time because the kids that I uh, work with um, they uh, sometimes they just don't know how and the world's kind of tough sometimes real superficial things are considered important in school settings really hard because the things that are important sometimes aren't really stressed enough to be honest the things that that matter like um, are kind of like they'll have a little assembly about it but I think it, it's not enough of the like like embedded in the curriculum. I do speech therapy, but to be honest, I just do friendship therapy, <laughs> you know, because like I maybe I'm their only friend, but I am their friend. I try to be. I try to be their friend no matter what they're like. I'm I'm not always successful, but I try. And if I can't do it, because I'm not I'm not always the best fit for some kids, but I know other people that can, maybe they need a man, you know. Um, I don't think I'm answering your question quite, but I think um, if someone has trouble making friends, I think it just takes a lot of courage to get out there, you know, because, but as adults, um, what has helped me is going towards groups like this or even recovery, I'm in recovery group, that's helped me a lot, and also uh, talking so uh, my teachers help me a lot. So sometimes uh, we just need help to know that within us, we have great value. Is a, is a, no different than anyone else. Equal value to anybody. Everyone has this, everyone without exception. I t with my students, I just tell them each one, I, I just tell them what has helped me. I'm like, I see them like I show up to Lama Jim, but like so depressed. Everybody's like, there's hell that bad energy. And he's like, now I'm having a good day. You know, and I'm like, you're kidding. <laughs> you know, because I I've been through many things and I'm getting so much better than I used to be. But because of him, I just like, you know, that helped me just to hear not no matter how I show up, now I'm having a good day. So I just they show up, they that's how I greet him. Oh, you're here. I didn't know you were coming. I thought you might not come. Now I'm having a good day kind of like that. You know what's helped me? Giving that what I need. That's helped me. Giving out what I've needed. I give, like, if I'm extremely stressed, I might be more friendly than I ever imagined. Inside, I might be feeling real anxious, but I'm like, oh, I just give out what I think was helpful to me. It's not always working, but most of my students respond to that, most of them. And if, like I say, I'm not the best fit for everyone, so sometimes I, I have friends that you know, you know, I work in a diverse school. Sometimes what those kids need, they need to see someone that looks like them, that mirrors, like, uh, mirrors back to them value. Like, fortunately, my principal is African-American, 
and he's just the coolest guy and like and he's a and he's a he and he can give them things I can't so I just try to notice those kind of things and do what I can and you know as it's never too late as I mean I showed up here in my 40s I'm in my 60s now you know it's a journey we we don't think just one life we think going lifetimes this is like the stream of life times and also we uh, like our hardships can be our best thing we call them our jewels because our understanding if we can transform it can be something others will see that we do understand they will see oh i understand being shy and they'll say she does and that's right away that's a connection it's very helpful very helpful I didn't know I was going to go on, 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 on. <laughs> Thank you, Patty, as always. I'm noticing how much, uh, and I, I aspire to this, that you're relying less on notes and speaking. Oh, yeah, that, so. I have to write something. Oh, I'll, sure, of I'll, course, I'll, of course. i show up here and really have, be a blank. But wow, two weeks in a row, that's that's pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it's not meant to be. Uh, like, uh, uh, Colleen really is very sick, so oh. she couldn't, so that's why. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I wanted to share a quick little story and then a thought that I was having related to your talk. So the story is about my daughter, Lily, mm -hmm. um, who we dropped off at college last week. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Probably our biggest worry about her is her um, excessive uh, social anxiety and, and mm -hmm. shyness and would she be able to connect and make friends. She had a good group of friends here uh, in, in this area, but you know, that was parents always worry, I think. Mm -hmm when you they, like uh, the empty nest, like they're, they're going to plummet <laughs> out of the nest. So um, she sent us a text about um, she had made some acquaintances and she was, they were sitting out on the quad and um, she saw that her acquaintances sitting with some other kids. And she said, I summoned the courage of a million lions and went and asked if I could join them. No. And so they said, of course. So she sat down with them and she said that they, uh, they all talked. Um, she made new friends. They talked until the nighttime, and then some of them were tired, so they they went back to their dorms. And she and her new friends, her three friends, sat, sat in her room and talked in silly until one a.m. So she put it. And I was thinking about um, yeah, that's friendship, right? Um, how important that is. And she's. You know, she's just thriving in this early on, but because she made connections that she was afraid she couldn't make. And she took that vulnerability to, you know, to say, maybe, you know, they might want to hang out with me, even when I, I'm not sure they would. Uh, she took that chance, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about like this, one of the main roots of suffering, the self-cherishing attitude. And when we think of cherishing, I think we think, you know, aggrandizing, but I think it's also just the excessive focus on self. Like, I think the people who self cherish often are trying to avoid the bad feelings they have about themselves. So they're, they're amassing, look at me and look how great I am, as if they're proving to themselves that they're not so terrible, mm -hmm. if that makes sense, right? And so, um, friendship, I was thinking as you were talking, like, friendship is, is taking us from that self cherishing attitude. And um, it's a, it's an interdependent uh, cherishing of another who might cherish us, and so it just helps us to let go a little bit of it all being about me, me, me. Yeah. So I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I um, well, one of my one of my dear friends, they they told me actually that, uh, and I thought. It, it hit me so hard, I think, because of the truth of what they said. They said, it's all about you, you know, in our friendship. So I think, and there is a great suffering in that, you know, like thinking how the other person's affecting me and all that kind of thing, uh, self-cherishing. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, uh, if I'm going in the right stream as you, but, but maybe I'll go to the one part that you said and see if that rings true for you. 
do you mean like if somebody uh, is kind of building themselves up uh, this one part you said somebody's building themselves up quite a lot and kind of trying to be better than others but beneath that they're they're actually feeling pretty horrible inside is, is this is this right yeah i think that it's more like um the more that we believe that there's a separate independently existing self um that we the root of everything is is through that perspective mm -hmm. um that's where we really suffer and it's it's it, everything becomes in relation to us and um we have this negativity bias um and so i think you know that person didn't smile at me they don't like me um, we, it just becomes all about me and we're always looking for these ways of building ourselves up and, and seeing evidences of where it's not happening and um, I think that's a, a lot of that suffering comes from that um, seeing others and only in relation to us mm -hmm. if that makes sense and so a friendship requires you to um, to show like you were saying all sides of yourself um, and have them accept you for the parts that you don't accept yourself for and also to accept them for the parts that they don't accept themselves for mm -hmm. and so it's it's a way of um loosening the hold on it just being about me 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 mm -hmm. i i can't add anything to that <laughs> i i think what you're saying makes uh makes sense to me i uh yeah that's yeah i mean you know, just taking things personally so so quickly, person, you know, that, that so a lot of suffering around that, you know, like somebody's just having a bad day, you know, <laughs> you're thinking right away here, instead of wondering what's happening for them, you're thinking they don't like me or it's, you know, it's just kind of, kind of like that's a layer that doesn't need to be there. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Okay, first, thank you, Patty, so much for your talks. I feel honored to be here a second week in a row that you're speaking. Um, you truly have just so much value for our community. Um, and I love the talk on friendship because I'm kind of nurturing some of my own as an adult now, some that didn't make it through childhood and early adulthood, and some that I've had from I'll say like my cousin specifically, who we kind of lost touch because of families, but have recently um, come back together in just this huge supportive way. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me think of like, you know, sometimes we don't like all parts or we don't have to like all parts because you're your own person and you just be you, but I'm gonna love you from over here. So I very much appreciated that perspective for us to chew on a little bit. Yeah. Um, I had another thought, but it's totally gone from me, me now. So oh. <laughs> there it goes. I think that's that it. Okay. Thank you, Patty. Everything you say is always very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I think the point uh, that you made about to take some courage in taking the the steps to go out there. And I think the other thing that's really important is to stick with it, with, with a person you consider or you wish to be a friend, mm -hmm. because there will be various parts that aren't compatible maybe with yourself. And again, getting away from the concept of myself, it's me, it's about me. And the more you think that it's about the other person and what you can do for the other person and to be able to, um, stick with it when things go rough or you see differences to me that's what's made my best long term year after year after year what i would consider my friends mm -hmm. is that we've been there for each other through lots of things over a long a period of time and i think that's one thing that the being um in a sangha can help us with because once you commit yourself to be there. You don't just leave when somebody is annoying. You can work it out and um, have other people that are supporting you in that effort. So I want to thank you for that. That's my comment. Thank you, Sue. Hey, thanks, Patty. 
Um, that was pretty cool. Um, so I wish my students heard this. Yeah. <laughs> Elderly lady or cool, which one? <laughs> <laughs> we'll stop by and you know give me some props one day maybe. Um, no, but I I really like the subject. Um, and I so I moved to Sacramento in like 2021, and it was tough for me to make friends in the beginning. Um, but I don't know. I, I mean, meeting people and connecting people is always just something that I really like to do. It's like one of my favorite things. Um, and like, I don't know, my life, I do find that, um, especially in the last like five plus years that I, there are things in life that happen that like you do grow apart from people that you still really care about. And that doesn't mean that they're bad people or anything. It just means that as one friend, if, if you feel yourself growing apart from other people, I feel like what I've found is if you don't already have them, you may need to go out and get some new friends because like the amount of friends that you need for me at least, or the amount of like, I, I don't know, the amount of relate, the amount of healthy relationships you need, like it doesn't really just dissipate or anything like you still need those mm -hmm. and so if friends move away or you move away it's definitely something that like kind of like you're saying with your daughter like you have to go out and show some courage and that can be hard like i was just and um i joined this running club because i like running and i don't know i like and a bunch of people have similar interests and i was like i talked to a few people after we ran this morning and but like I, I kind of like what you said about showing courage. Like I'm like next time we meet, I'm gonna try to like go into some groups and be like, hey guys, you know what's up, you know stuff like that. But anyways, I, I really appreciate the talk. I really like the part where you said it's about liking every part of someone too. Mm -hmm. That's something that I think I need to remind myself when I'm like nitpicking about like some argument I've had with people because mm -hmm. I do that sometimes. Like I'm like oh, they were wrong, I was right, you know. Forget, but forget I need their to... good parts. Yes, know? exactly. Like you have amnesia that there's anything good. Hyper focus on the current thing and that happens on like the worst days you know uh -huh. where you're like oh my god why am i even but you know that's not the right way to look at it so cool thank you thank you friends i remembered my comment <laughs> okay um you had mentioned that coming here was something that was really helpful and i found something very similar in this space and i've been lovingly calling it being socially adjacent and when i don't feel like necessarily being one-on-one -on -one with some of my friends that i do have i go be in a space where i'm gonna find like-minded people and so that doesn't necessarily mean go to a bar and hang out, although it's not the worst, but, you know, depending on your lifestyle, mm -hmm. but being in a place where there's other people that might have similar thoughts as you, you might not talk with them the first time you're there or the second time, but you know that you're with like minded people and mm -hmm. I find that that's incredibly helpful for at least having other perspectives and a social aspect in my life when I can't do the one on one. So if anyone needed any uh. <laughs> tips. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Another great talk. Um, I I lived here, but I moved to the Bay Area and lived there for 27 years, or I can't remember, 40 years. I don't know. A lot. <laughs> a lot of my years. And then I, I um, you know, I had friends there. And when I moved back here, what was it about four or five years ago, I only had one friend, and that was a friend I had from middle school or junior high and high school. And I didn't know anybody else here except uh, my immediate family. And until I started coming here. Mm -hmm. And my world just got huge. And it was so easy to make friends. And I really do consider people here my friends, my good friends, you know? That doesn't mean that we, um, like you said, go to the movies together or, or do that. But I know that I can come here and have friendship and be surrounded, like Alex was saying, you know, people of like mind. And I just made a new friend today in Alex. Mm -hmm. So that's really exciting. So anyway, that's, that's just it just how um, grateful I am to be able to know that I can come someplace and be surrounded by friends. How often do we get to do that? So 
Thank now, you. Because of you, we're surrounded by flowers. <laughs> yes, <laughs> all the time. Susan's our flower Thanks, person. Patty. <laughs> See behind me. Oops. Well, they need a little help. Oh, I'm going to fix that one right after. <laughs> oh, that one's oh, going to get repaired. Oh, that's bothering her. She's very particular. It's right above your head, and it's oh, like, I no, know. why didn't oh, I oh. take okay. that carnation out oh. of there? It's drooping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Patty. Okay. So, uh, so. Doing. One mine? So maybe maybe one more question and then or comment. Okay, it looks like we have a comment online here um, from, I think it's Genesis. So, my heart was deeply touched by your sharing today. Thank you for being a genuine, vulnerable friend to us all. Oh, thank you, Genesis. I like your name, Genesis. <laughs> I, I feel like I need a, my, my students have really colorful names. My name, I'm Pat, Miss, they call me Miss Patty. It's easy to say, yeah. Oh, Miss Elderly Lady Patty. Yeah. I, t I play it up. I'm like, yeah, that's right. So if you need to be gentle with me, look, I'm old. You don't run away from me. That's too hard for me. I could never catch you. That works. That helps too. Okay, Eli, are you ready to uh, do dedication? Dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chanrezig Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, pleasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losangdrakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. So I have a couple announcements. So uh, in September, on, um, let's see, I think it's the 17th, we are having a uh, um, uh, a volunteer, they're called Daleks, and Susan is, and Lama Jimpa are, um, is that for everybody? Is that, is that an in-house? Everybody. So if you wish to volunteer, um, so if you're here today, you can talk to Susan. Susan's here in the white shirt. And uh, it's a, for volunteers with, um, who want to learn about like uh, helping our community and helping people not in our community, like people are already doing those things but we're just going to get uh, to come together and kind of talk about ways we can help our our community and then um and then uh after in october there's uh, a couple of things coming up october um 7th 8th is a is a um, teacher visiting named geshe gendon and geshe gendon is going to give a workshop about um volunteering to uh it's introduction to what chaplaincy is and it's going to be over two days and there's registration available online and also there if you if you uh email info at lionsroar dot info at lionsroar dharma center dot com or dot org if you info at lionsroar dharma center dot org you can uh, uh get a registration link and then um then we also have a teacher visiting named geshe tenge who's from sarah J. I know this is a lot to remember, um, Sarah J. But if you uh, sign up for the newsletter, you can uh, get these dates. It's better than me talking. But um, it's on the 14th and the 28th. He's going to teach. Those are Saturdays about Lojong or mind training, which um, includes uh, some of what we're talking about today about the, like, for example, the Bodhisattva way of life or 
They have this other one called the Wheel of Sharp Weapons. These are um, just very, he's going to just do an introductory series on that. So I just wanted to mention those couple things. Oh, and uh, Susan has one other thing for. Thank you. So I'm not sure how this feeds into friendship, but I think it does. Um, back here, we have a little book um, that is a book for prayers and practices to benefit people that we know who are having a difficult time, either physically or mentally or emotionally. And um, it, it, we just enter a name and um, sort of the desired outcome that we'd like to have for this person and what kind of a prayer or practice you'd like to have done for this person, even if this person is you. Um, so I just, it's just another way of expressing your caring and your concern for, you know, other people that you know. Um, and there was one comment um, earlier this month, somebody wanted to know, is it okay if we ask for prayers to God? And like, yes, <laughs> you know, whatever you need, whatever you think they need, put that down. You know, it doesn't need to be, you know, a medicine Buddha or a Tara practice. It could be just, um, think of wide open, calming peaceful spaces when you think of this person it could be prayers to god it could be mantras whatever but yeah whatever whatever you think is needed by that person that's what to put down so i'm just kind of reminding that that's books there and it's for anybody and everybody to use and um, anybody who comes here to do practice um, we look at that book and we include those people in our prayers. So um, it's, it's, it's there for, for healing. Yeah. Anyway, thanks. Okay. Thank you, Susan. So I'm going to hang out for just a little while. If anybody wants to talk, I, I'm going to have a cup of coffee, I think. <laughs> so, um, I'm glad you all have made it today. That's so nice to see people coming. And next week, Lama Jimpo will be here, and he's going to give a talk about his retreat and um, about what retreat, the value of retreat. So that, that'll be really good next, next Sunday. Thank you. Omo Om Arayapatana <laughs>